It has been one year since my supposed last ever Powerpuff 2016 reboot video. And, well, I guess that was a lie because I've decided to dig the corpse out of this show's grave and rip it to shreds one final time. I'm sure this is questionable to some, seeing as I said I was done with the show forever in my conclusion video, but I'll be completely transparent with you guys as to why I'm doing this. A. It's my channel's six year anniversary and I wanted to do something special to celebrate. B. I've wanted to try doing ranking videos again since I haven't in a few years and I figured the PPG reboot was the perfect subject matter to test the waters because I already have the entire series ingrained in my brain and can still recall every episode from memory. And C. Nearly all of my season one reviews are completely outdated because my analytical skills have grown exponentially since I first started making those videos. I know I said in my ending video that I was content with those reviews saying they captured how I felt, but I went back to watch some of them in recent times and realized that no, that was kind of a false statement. I've matured, my tastes have changed. Since I finished reviewing season one, I've earned a degree in film studies, experienced seasons two and three, and grew a lot as a critic. Plus, like, half of those videos are just summaries anyways. I never really got into any specifics with the first half of Season 1. Some of you may be thinking that this is just going to be a repeat of my top 5 Season 1 videos I made as a recap of that season in 2018, but oh no, are those lists beyond outdated. My feelings on a lot of these episodes have completely changed since then, now that I have more perspective as somebody who's also delved into Seasons 2 and 3, followed by taking a year off from the series. Even when I was ending my reviews on the show, over a year ago, I contemplated some sort of ranking or re-review video on season one because people were asking me about it, but didn't end up going through with it because I was, quite frankly, ready to be done. Well, now that some time has passed, I'm in the mood to make that video happen, so that's what I'm doing here, ranking every season one episode of the Powerpuff 2016 reboot from worst to best. Some episodes I like more now, some episodes I like a lot less, and some I haven't really changed much on. The only thing I can guarantee you is that the worst episode I'm talking about here hasn't changed. Number 39. You're a princess, that's clear enough, but a princess is better when she's tough. Explosion! What an utter disgrace. This is still to this day the worst piece of animation I have ever seen when it comes to its writing. An episode of a general audience show that clearly doesn't know what it wants to do, so it just fucks off and says whatever it wants without ever considering the implications or consequences it's brewed. Normally I could forgive sheer incompetence like this because it was probably unintentional, but when an episode presents its message in such a sloppy, reckless, apathetic manner, clearly exhibiting a lack of care towards the issue in question, I can't let that slide. I mean, a family cartoon that actively preaches the idea that you shouldn't stop somebody from putting themselves in harm's way, especially in situations where they could end up taking their own life? That's just negligence, to such an immense degree. I get that some people don't take the concept as seriously as I do, but as somebody who's had his fair share of real-life encounters with the subject, suicide is not something to be taken lightly, and that's all I'll say on the matter. I despise that the episode treats it as nothing more than a mere joke. Furthermore, the fact that the moral the episode ends on, that being that Princess Blueballs felt that the girls weren't letting her be herself when the girls never did such a thing and in fact encouraged her to do the exact thing that she said they wouldn't let her do, it completely contradicts itself. You guys didn't respect me for who I was in the first place. You don't need to be saved. You can do anything you want with your life. Yeah, like run your own company or punch bad guys. Anything besides being all dainty for some prince that'll never show up. Then there's this added in segment about the prince who just sat around playing games as though it's some kind of powerful statement on men and like, I get what it's going for, but the key to making a true feminist work of art is not to attack or belittle another sex. Maybe instead of just trying to make another group of people look worse, you instead make the group you're trying to empower look powerful? Gee, there's a thought. What a concept. If the cartoon wanted to exhibit a strong female character, then by all means go for it. I love seeing truly well-written female characters in media, but don't have that female rely on the behavior of a male in order to show that. By introducing this male character to the scenario, the depiction of the female is now dependent on the male, inherently giving her less agency than the male himself because he dictates her portrayal as well as his own. Even if he is portraying himself in a negative light, he is in control of how the female looks relative to his person. It's 
it's the complete antithesis to what the show should be doing with an episode like this, because the princess's ultimate decision is dependent on the way that he behaves. The prince was a completely unnecessary character that never needed to appear in this episode. Blue Balls never needed to be contrasted against him because the entire story is trying to preach this idea about her being an individual, and yet in its very conclusion it takes that individuality away from her and gives it to the man. The hypocrisy of Blue Bell's turning on the girls, the message that the girls take away from the situation, all of it completely flubbed in the worst possible way. This isn't even going into other problems the episode has, like the shoehorned rap song that serves no narrative purpose, fails to be comedic no matter what lens you choose to view the episode from, and screams out at just how soulless and creatively bankrupt this reboot truly was. That on top of the abysmal attempt at parodying Disney's film Enchanted, along with the incredibly forgettable songs that I guess were supposed to be more significant than they actually were because I couldn't tell you the melody to a single one of them. Which is shocking because I still know how plenty of the songs from the reboot go, despite not having seen them for years. You remember that montage song from Secret Swapper? I still recite that song word for word to this very day. The professor's trust, trust, it's all about trust. Break it and you'll spontaneously combust. Yeah, that's ingrained in my memory for the rest of time. Total Eclipse of the Cart's lunch song, the spring song from Snow Month, all of those have stuck with me and probably will until the day I'm in the ground, no matter how bad they are. But the fact that the episode that's meant to be a parody of Disney movies doesn't have a single memorable song in it, that's just sad. That's a complete and total failure. I remember this episode better than any other for being a colossal mountain of shit, and yet I couldn't tell you how any of the songs go. It's just a sad, pitiful waste of time, resources, and money, and is the epitome of the worst things you could possibly do to a family animated series. I am convinced there was not a single revision made to this script, or there were 500 million revisions made to the script, and then somehow this got nominated for a primetime Emmy? The fuck? Of all the episodes the Cartoon Network could have submitted that year, they chose this? What? I'm sorry for dragging this first entry on for so long, but I had to get it out of my system one last time. I don't really like to hold grudges, but oh boy, I'm going to be resenting Once Upon a Townsville until the end of my lifetime. Words are not enough to express how repugnant I find this episode to be. Utter dog shit. And it always will be. That makes me so happy, I could just sing! Number 38. It's spring, it's spring, spring is in the air. Birds are chirping, bees say buzz of fresh bees through my hair. Okay, surprise, surprise, Snow Month is just as trash as it always was. Honestly, my opinion hasn't changed much on this one either. It's still an utter mess when it comes to pacing, structure, and general character progression that just meanders all over the place to try and tell some sort of struggle about Blossom being nervous on how to respond to a boy liking her, but it's such a flop in execution. First off, the fact that the episode kicks off with the first day of spring leads the viewer to expect a sense of renewal, a fresh start, some sort of beginning to something that would progress as the episode goes on. Instead, it's a total contradiction because the actual episode's events result in a month-long delay, a halting, a pause. The implication of these events is that everything is put on hold, frozen in time as the everlasting snow month seems to have no end in sight. Thematically speaking, it is the polar opposite of what the first scene establishes. Several people seem to have missed this point I made about this in the original video, getting hung up on the fact that it can snow in springtime depending on where a person lives geographically. I never said this couldn't happen. I even acknowledge this in the video. My complaint was with the thematic tone that the episode creates through its opening act and how it blatantly goes against everything that follows, but I guess this idea just went over some people's heads. The only sequence that exhibits any amount of fun is the sledding portion where the girls race down the mountain because, yeah, the girls are having fun during it. It actually kind of put a smile on my face. But then it throws in these yetis who won't let them sled anymore even though the girls could just beat them up for trespassing and claiming ownership of public property. Like that's an actual crime, and the girls have the right to attack them because they're superheroes fighting crime, which is totally what they do in the original show, but here, no such action is taken. The Zack Yeti is also incredibly forced and is a pitiful attempt at adding suspense to the escalating argument between Blossom and her sisters during the final moments. And the cherry on top of the disaster that is Snow Month is that Blossom did all of this because she was afraid to tell a boy she liked him, even though she does, and he is explicitly telling her he likes her, and then there's the whole Jared situation.
transition from season two, which, while unintentional, is still incredibly short-sighted on this show's part. But worst of all, she says they should just be friends, and then literally every other episode of the entire 120 fucking episode series, Blossom is swooning over this guy wanting to be with him, so the outcome of this episode is contradictory, null, and void. It's a pointless episode, a complete waste of time, and Jaren never should have been brought back after this. Forcing somebody to sit through Snow Month should be punishable by law. Number 37. You know, initially I ranked this as the fifth worst episode of the series, but I take it back. This takes the number three spot, easily. Not just for the Donnie controversy, which like, yes, it was a terrible fucking idea for them to advertise this episode as being a progressive effort as an allegory to trans individuals, but it just straight up doesn't have a natural flow to its cause and effect. The whole episode, Donnie wants a horn because he wants to be a unicorn, and then the big reveal at the end is that he was a unicorn the whole time because he never looked under his hair? That's a big ask of the show to make the audience believe that this dipstick, one, has had his hair this long since birth, two, has never looked under his hair his entire lifetime, and three, has never felt the horn on his head. What does this show take its audience for, brain dead idiots? It's so presumptuous and demeaning to think that this was believable for anybody. I am certain, I am certain, there are thousands of kids out there that would have asked, how come he didn't feel it on his head, when they saw this. This does raise the question of where the boundary is for how far you can take an idiot character before they're too stupid and this overstepped that line by a mile. Completely trust you, brah. I also want to bring attention to something that I've never really talked about before. The Dolly Parton reference. It is completely random and out of place for the target demographic of this show. Because what kid watching this is going to know who Dolly Parton is? There have been instances where the show has come out and said that it was intended for children and that adults outside of the target demographic are getting upset over something not intended for them, but like, explain the references to cultural figures that only adults watching the show would get. Why are those in there if they serve no purpose to the child audience, hmm? The only argument that I could see being made here is that it was for the show's staff itself, but isn't the show's staff comprised of adults? And then, of course, yes, Donnie turning into a monster, being made to look like a freak, and honestly being put in the wrong for wanting to change his appearance? Yeah, the LGBT crowd had every right to raise awareness about how insulting this episode is. It's disgusting that the higher-ups of Cartoon Network tried to pass this off the way they did. Oh, and then the day is saved because magical unicorns used magic to magically wish the problem away. The end. I wish I was harder on this episode in the past because, man, say what you want about Painbow, but at least it wasn't targeting a group of people. Number 36. Oh hey, what do you know? Painbow is taking the number 36 spot as the fourth worst episode of season one for all the reasons that everybody already knows. Yes, the twerking sucks, blah blah blah, what an original stance. That's only a few seconds of the greater problems that this episode actually has. A contrived scenario, lol so random humor, references to memes that were already outdated at the time of airing that are only even more outdated now that the show has ended, plot immunity that never gets explained, a main character who's really bratty and annoying to listen to, and an obnoxious villain with an irritating voice, overly repetitive theme music, and a character trait that never gets explained for as long as the series goes on. Honestly, you've heard my criticisms of Painbow numerous times before, and I kinda already got my gripes out of the way with my Largo review, where I pointed out all of the opportunities that that episode had to correct this one, yet failed to do so for even one idea, but hey. It's still trash, it'll never improve with time, in fact it's only going to get worse with time, and is forever going to remain as one of the most popular examples people will go to to prove just how atrocious this garbage reboot really was. I just wish people would call this episode out for more than just the twerking, because it's so much worse than that. Buttercup, I think something is amiss in Townsville. <laughs> Number 35. Maybe this isn't fair of me to retroactively rank this episode worse than before because of my experience with the Professor Utonium character in seasons 2 and 3, but this is my personal list so I'm ranking this where I want it, and Professor Proofed is most definitely the worst Professor Utonium episode of season 1. Do you enjoy seeing a middle-aged, grown man act like a child? If so, maybe you'll like this episode, but this is one of the most unflattering depictions of the Professor in the entire series. I've gone on this spiel several times by this point and you probably already know why I hate the 2016 Professor, so I'll spare that. Just know that him acting like a baby has zero explanation or sense given to it, and it is so detestable. The girls act overprotective for like a 15 second montage and then he's just suddenly afraid of the outside world even though he should know better than this given his age and assumed maturity. It's so contrived. It goes completely against what the character is supposed to be. It's not believable for a second. I also hate giants, 
babies and giant babies, so this was doomed to fail for me personally from the start. There's not a single joke in this entire episode that even made me smirk, and I sure hope nobody's afraid of jump-scaring sharks, because otherwise you'll probably have a negative reaction to this too. I gotta agree with Ribbonhead. First, you sprain your wrist a little, and the next thing you know, BAM! Shark attack! Like, yeah, I see it coming as an adult, but what about the kids who are still new to media and haven't experienced this sort of thing enough to know it's coming? I could have been outright terrified by this when I was younger. Glad to see those kids were taken into consideration with this joke. Number 34. Initially, when I reviewed Frenemy, I felt pressured to say nice things about it because a few people that were commenting on my videos at that time were saying I was being unfair to the show and that I was a bad critic and blah 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 other internet hatey things. Well, in retrospect, now that I'm more experienced, I can say that those people were just being dicks, and now this is my opportunity to say how I truly feel about it. Frenemy is such a poorly written story that I could use no better word to describe it than inexperienced. This is first grade level writing here. The professor would never put his girls in danger under any circumstance, yet his supposed thirst for knowledge overrides that as a priority for him. What kind of bullshit excuse is that? Oh, it, it was for the sake of a joke? Then why isn't anybody laughing? This is to the total detriment of the character and him as a parent. It's disgraceful. And then the girls just break out of the mind control necklaces all of a sudden because the power of love? Sorry, Jemica, but our family is stronger than your fake friendship! Girls! Family forever! Dude, this is just flat out embarrassing. Not to mention that they portray Jemica as this cool kid at school by having her say snoof because I guess the show was trying to make it a thing, but it gets dropped and forgotten about so quickly that it never mattered in the first place. Yeah, no, Frenemy isn't that great after all. This was the only episode review I made where I truly felt like I held back and made the episode out to sound better than it actually was. It relies on far too much convenient occurrences to make for a good story, and Jemica as a villain didn't get better until season 2. This first appearance was weak, and also she somehow survived a plane falling out of the sky without explanation. Trash episode. Number 33. Oh man, I hate this episode more now than I did back then. Bubbles of the Opera is actually one of the most cumbersome rewatches I've had to sit through on my season 1 revisit. Nothing about this episode is entertaining to watch, it's just, let's write Bubbles so that she's forced to endure all these tragic things that causes her appearance to make her look uglier because being ugly is bad. Now tilt your head this way, reach that shoulder to the sky, and say, give me the sauce! Tilt head, rate my shoulder, give me the what? I really don't buy that Bubbles would take a bad photo like this because it's already been established in the episode that she loves to strike poses. It'd be one thing if the person operating the camera, which is a shit character by the way, messed up the photo herself, but no, the episode clearly shows that Bubbles was the one who took a bad photo, and there really wasn't any reason for it when the previous scene establishes just how photogenic she is. Then there's the haircut scene where Bubbles could have just said no and not let the person cut her hair. There's the makeup scene, which is the only one I understand because I can't believe she wouldn't have known she'd have an allergic reaction to it, and just with the way the ceiling fan plays out, you can tell how convenient it is. I'm not gonna let this get me down. Uh, Bubbles, you're heading right for the- <laughs> At least the professor's a good dad in this episode for once, and is the only reason why I'm ranking it higher than the previous few episodes with the prof. The title of this episode is Garbage, and I still don't really see the connection other than the fact that Bubbles wears this eye mask, which like, by the way, for some reason her skin reaction just went away in what I'm assuming to be is like, I don't know, maybe six hours time. Sure, one could say that the cathedral scene takes place like a week after the dentist scene, but the episode provides no time progression whatsoever, so it's anybody's guess. You just beg the question of what happened in between all the time, the longer you assume it takes place after she gets made fun of by the kids on the bus. Did she skip school? What has she been eating? Etc, etc. Well, whatever, then she dons this dark Bubbles persona and casts out her former life just like that. I guess you could say... The Bubbles you know is gone! The other thing too is like, Bubbles' sisters and the kids on the bus and the school photographer, all of them are responsible for making Bubbles the way she is, and then at the end of the episode Bubbles is convinced by her sisters telling her she's a good person and then she's just like, okay with how I look now. There's no 
cause and effect. There's no logical progression to jump to this conclusion. It makes no sense for the character. She gets no comeuppance for letting all the animals free and terrorizing the town. Mojo takes the fall when he didn't even do anything. Bubbles recruited him, in case you don't remember, which he literally contributed nothing to their plan, so the only reason he's even in the episode is to punish him instead of Bubbles when they're there at night, even though he doesn't deserve it. And all the characters that ruin Bubbles' complexion face no sort of punishment whatsoever. What a cowardly move. Just pin it on the bad guy character instead of making all of these awful people get what they deserve. It's not a fun episode. It's miserable. The only saving grace here is the professor's portrayal. Number 32, an episode about bullying that gives off the completely wrong idea about how to solve bullying? Gee, what a surprise that it's in the top 10 worst. In the episode, The Wrinkle Gruff Gals, the girls end up getting bullied at a new school, which already makes zero fucking sense because they're the town saviors and you know damn well that if there were kids with superpowers at a fucking school, they'd either be idolized or feared because nobody would want to mess with somebody that could kill them in 2.5 seconds. But the girls are feeling mistreated, so they ask the professor to make them older and then the girls drink more of the potion that they're supposed to and oh wow, now they're old and they're still being bullied until they start giving all the kids free stuff and then they aren't bullied anymore. Yeah. We don't want hard candy, Grandma! I understand. This candy is probably too hard for you anyways. Hey, this ain't totally terrible. Can we have some more? Us too! So the solution to bullying that this episode is offering is to give your bullies your personal belongings. Don't stand up for yourself, just give them your valuables and they won't bully you anymore. That's the key right there. This episode is literally the most generic, bland, milk toast piece of human garbage episode about kids at school with the only bright spot being that the bullies come to respect the girls in the end, I guess, but the means in which that conclusion is reached is the major problem here. As somebody who was bullied, I'm kind of offended because no, giving somebody my things will not have stopped them from picking on me. Oh, and there are references to the original series which this show wishes it could be on the same level as. <laughs> as if. Yeah disappointed. My teeth won't even stay in. What? Speak up, I can't hear you. <sighs> Who are you people? Again I ask, how would kids find this fun to watch? I moved this one down on the list a little bit because I find the episodes that I moved above it to be a bit more painstaking to watch, but this episode is still trash. Number 31. Who loves episodes about forced love interests? Well, we got another one, this time featuring Sapna, who the professor has been seeing, and oh my lord, this one is so terribly strung together that nobody seemed to stop for two seconds and say, hey, wait a minute, does this even make sense? The answer to that question is no. No, it doesn't. First, everything starts with the professor not telling his daughters that she's coming until she gets there, which like, is super inconsiderate right off the bat, but lo and behold, the show wrote the professor to be like that, what a surprise. Then, the episode brings her in and tries to make her look bad by finding the most minuscule ways that she can bother the girls, such as having five people crammed on the couch, which like, considering she's a guest, maybe one or two of the girls could, oh, I don't know, move onto the floor at literally any time, or pull up a chair because that's the courteous thing to do. The professor also takes the popcorn from Bubbles without asking, but like, that's the professor's fault, not Sapna's. And then she somehow spoils the live television event that hasn't happened yet by saying that she looked up what happens online, which like, okay, that's the entire basis for this episode's conflict then? That she somehow found a leak and spoiled a TV special that wasn't even confirmed to be true necessarily? Ugh, but that's not even that bad when you find out that every time Sapna feels love, she turns into a giant spider, but then that raises the question of, why the fuck is she dating somebody if she can't allow herself to feel love? Who thought of this? What? And then yeah, there's a stupid fight between her and the girls where the girls get captured and then somehow break out of the spider web at the exact moment that the episode needs them to for literally no reason. Like, why couldn't they break this webbing at literally any other moment prior to this? Well, whatever, they punch Sapna three times, except you don't actually see it, and she turns back to normal. <sighs> okay, look, I'm doing my best to avoid mentioning most of the minor writing mistakes and animation errors as much as possible because those should all just be assumed for practically every single episode. This pathetic excuse for a show is just littered with them. If it seems like I'm glossing over certain details with these episodes, that would be why. Number 30, 
Did Cartoon Network really never stop and think, does it even make sense for our character to break a bone when she's got superhuman strength, endurance, and has survived a hell of a lot more physical trauma than this? Clearly not. The way that her arm gets broken is a complete joke because it's not even believable in the slightest. Packrat is such a stupid villain that it's no wonder why he only came back once after the ninth episode of the show, and somebody really needed a spelling lesson because the vast number of grammatic and phonetic mistakes that occur in all three seasons is flat out embarrassing. When the entire crux of your episode is dependent on an illogical, improbable idea, it's doomed to fail from the start. Yeah, it's great that the episode wants to depict breaking a bone as this relatable thing that a lot of kids go through, but it's not believable for the scenario that these characters are in. Somebody once tried to justify this to me by saying that Goku got hurt by a rock that one time in a DBZ episode, which I've never seen, but A, that's a complete non sequitur that has nothing to do with my criticisms of this episode, B, was done in that episode for the sake of a joke, whereas this is played 100% straight, I looked the clip up on YouTube, I saw the scene where it happens, and C, the girls sustain damage all the time and I never said they couldn't. Getting hurt and breaking a limb are two different levels of physical body damage. You know what would have been a more apt comparison for this? An example where Goku breaks his arm by getting lightly pushed into a wall. The day that happens in Dragon Ball, then we'll talk. Number 29. The reboot version of Princess is a shit-tier character who never deserved to get as much screen time as she did because she was never a pleasure to witness whenever she showed up. The reboot really failed to learn how to make a character that's obnoxious within the show's own continuity but entertaining to the audience outside of the fourth wall. Every time Princess showed up in a reboot episode, I would always, always, always let out an audible groan because I knew I wasn't going to be entertained by her. I look forward to you all voting for me. More box that ad was totally great. Have a cupcake. This is Princess's worst appearance in the entire season, seeing as the premise is just Blossom and Princess calling each other names until they get to the big debate, which is also a wrestling match full of stupid. The fighting is terribly animated, the insults the girls throw at each other are meaningless, and the ultimate resolution is the most uninspired thing I've ever seen in an election-based cartoon episode. It is the most cliche, vanilla, predictable conclusion with this Matt Manser character who everybody knows is going to be elected at the end the first time he appears on screen, and he never comes back in the show again, which is a telltale sign as to how much it really cared about him. What was the intent of this episode? Like, it could have done something cool, but instead it just did nothing at all. It was just name calling. It's 11 minutes of name calling. It was a forgettable, by the numbers, annoying waste of time as Princess and Blossom shouted back and forth at each other, and then it just ends. Pointless. Number 28. Halt and Catch Silico should be a lesson to everybody. Revise what you write before submitting your final draft. This episode is one of the best examples I could go to to show just how little of a shit the show gave towards its own rules, world, and continuity. The PPGs unintentionally destroyed Silico's robots as a kid, so he spent years of his life wanting to get his revenge. But Bliss was created 10 years prior to the present day, which contradicts the amount of time that passed since Silico was a kid. It also implies that the girls were attending Pokey Oaks for years upon years upon years when Wrinkle Gruff Gals claims that the reboot takes place the year after they graduated kindergarten. And Super Sweet Six heavily implies that the girls are six years old based on Princess's age, which is also backed up by the Wrinkle Gruff Gals showing the girls one year after kindergarten, and considering that the original series girls were always assumed to be five or six years old and that this reboot is claiming to be building off of the original series, none of it makes any sense. No thought was put into this. The show just dumped out an episode without bothering to try and the character with the most potential that they set up suffered so much because of it that he was never able to recover. Silico is the definition of wasted potential. Not to mention how abysmal the rest of the episode is. The fact that Townsville just turns on the girls because tabloids say so? Not even after she poured a poopy? Oh no, she didn't! The fact that Silico did nothing with the cliffhanger from Viral Spiral, the fact that the action teases the audience with coming close to being interesting but then still restraining itself anyways, what a piss poor excuse for a follow up to one of the best episodes of the season. I hate it. Number 27. Do you enjoy being lied to? Well, if so, maybe you'll actually like Rainy Day after all, but holy shit, one of the worst attributes of this entire reboot was the fact that it was so incapable of coming up with good 
titles. It's honestly sad that nobody could think of a single creative pun or phrase for 95% of the episodes, so instead they just replaced a word with a character's name, or in cases like this, came up with something that doesn't even reflect the episode. Rainy Day has nothing to do with a rainy day. The establishing shot shows that it's raining outside and then that's it. The rest of the episode happens and you wouldn't even know that it was raining because it doesn't play a part in the episode at all. It doesn't get referenced in later scenes, it doesn't come back at the end, there aren't even shots inside the house where you can see it raining outside. This entire plot could have happened on a sunny day and you wouldn't know the difference. It's just Blossom getting sent through time and coming back in a bunch of different costumes for 10 minutes. whoop de doo The professor is an idiot for not seeing through Buttercup and Bubbles' pitiful attempts at hiding what they did, and there's nothing more that needs to be said. Number 26. Somewhere over the swing set, or as I like to call it, Pain Bow 2, is a clear-cut example where I can see what the episode is going for, but it just fails in communicating the idea so, so hard. The girls get warped to an alternate dimension by flying up and over the swing set, right? And then proceed to discover that things are not what they seem. Well, the key problem of this episode is that the way it attempts to portray that they're in an alternate dimension make absolutely no sense. The professor is nice to the girls instead of being mad, the mayor is competent, Mojo and Fuzzy have a book club with the professor, although this is something I could totally believe the regular reboot Mojo would do, and there's a laugh track. You really did shove it in everyone's faces how much better you are than them. <laughs> I'm going Christmas shopping for my sweet little girls. It's June. I know. <laughs> It, what? It's just a jumbled mess of things, of stuff. I get what it wants to do, but none of this meshes well together. There's no consistency, there's no theme amongst the weirdness, nor are there rules of the dimension. Like, somehow the girls get warped here from a swing set and then they just wake up in bed? And then they can see the professor through their bathroom mirror at one point, implying they're in some sort of mirror dimension, except things aren't mirrored at all, and they didn't get here through a mirror, and also, why is this the only time or place they can see into the real world in the entire episode? Through this one specific mirror, and then the whole explanation for Allegro's return, being that he soaked up the girls' energy, which literally means nothing at all, is just terrible, first grade level writing. The excuses the episode gives are on the level of a horrendously bad fanfiction level of storytelling. He soaked up the girls' positive energy within this fake dimension so that he could recharge from their previous confrontation? What? How did he get out of the dimension to be the person advertising the swing set and then go back into the dimension? We never get an explanation for the blue bear thing either. The color filter gets annoying after a while, twerking occurs again. It's like Painbow Light, essentially. Not as bad as the first episode in terms of references to memes and shit, but heavily flawed in the writing department. I don't know. It makes no sense, but then again, it's very rare that the reboot episodes ever do. The lack of effort in writing here really shows though. Number 25. Little Octi Lost is debatably the best example I can give that depicts all three of the reboot puffs at their absolute worst. Buttercup is a selfish jerk who steals Octi because she's annoyed by her sister doing literally nothing wrong but then loses him. Bubbles is overly aggressive and so hyper fixated on Octi that it's the only thing she cares about even though Buttercup continues to apologize to her over and over again, but it doesn't matter to Bubbles and she only gives in and apologizes on her behalf after Buttercup's implied death, and Blossom refuses to answer the call of duty because she doesn't want to get dirty at a dump even though she gets dirty practically every time she fights a monster or villain anyways, but now that it's suddenly in a dump she just won't do it? I don't hate the episode as much as others, I ranked below it, but I was not hard enough on this episode the first time around. Also, this effect looks like garbage. And yes, I worded that pun that way on purpose. Packrat also sucks as a villain and I'm glad he only came back once across seasons 2 and 3. Also, the acronym of this episode spells out LOL. Think that was intentional? Probably. Number 24. This episode is boring. Sister Sitter features Buttercup taking care of her sister because they're sick with not swine flu, but hey, guess what? Buttercup being Buttercup, she doesn't take care of them when the professor puts her in charge, and then, oh hey, they're giant hogs now, I guess. This is also the introduction of Schedulebot, aka the professor's obnoxious sidekick, and speaking of the professor, that god-awful antidote song is the epitome of talking down to its audience. Drink the antidote, drink it up. <laughs> Who was this show made for? What age range? This feels like it's intended for two-year-olds, but then an episode like Horn Sweet Horn seems to be written at an elementary school level, but then Wrinkle Gruff Gals feels like it could be for middle schoolers? This song is in the same show as an homage to David Bowie's Space Oddity. 
Furthermore, the song just tells you how out of touch it was with kids because once a kid hits like, I don't know, five or six years old, they're past this brainless schlock. Dude, when I was that age watching Powerpuff Girls, I wanted to see monster fights. If a song like this was thrown in there, it honestly would have made me cringe as a kid and I'd probably stop watching. This is just bad. And the rest of the episode isn't much better. Buttercup learns some lesson that she forgets in the next episode, yada yada yada. It's not fun to watch her neglect her sisters. I had little else to say about it in my initial review, and the same holds true here. It boringly sucks. Number 23. The first season of the Powerpuff reboot was notorious for stealing episode plots from the original series and just doing them over again, but a thousand times worse than what came before, which is just sad because it indicates that the show was already running out of creative story ideas in the first season of its run. What's even more embarrassing is that Cartoon Network thought it was a good idea to promote the upcoming series with one of the most egregious examples in which this situation held true with none other than Man Up, a pathetic knockoff of the original season 6 episode, Make Zen to Me. You know what? What's the most sad thing about this whole stealing from the original situation though? It's that the majority of the episodes that it copied were from seasons 5 and 6, the seasons that literally everybody regards as the worst two seasons of the show, which is yet another one of the hundreds examples in which the reboot had no idea what it was doing. Was the thought process here to try and redo the bad episode ideas to make better versions of them? Well. Maybe, but most of the time these turned out worse than the season 5 and 6 episodes, so was it really worth it? In the episode Man Up, a new villain in town going by the name of Man Boy appears and he's nothing more than a degenerate male stereotype. Man Boy. Wow, what a creative name for a character. Gee, I wonder how long it took to come up with that. Anyways, the whole episode is about Buttercup learning to control her rage by chilling out, and it works for a time, but then at the end of the episode, it's all undone, so what was even the point? The episode tries to force humor with this tube man, and the backgrounds also look like garbage in the way it just randomly uses stock desert backgrounds. It goes on about this whole fire and water thing that sounds like it's trying to be more sophisticated than it really is. I can kind of see what Man Up is going for here, but it has so much misdirection that you can tell the show has no idea what it was trying to do. Plus Blossom's men comment is completely out of place and shouldn't belong in a Powerpuff Girls series for the exact same feminist reasons I gave during Once Upon a Townsville. There was an entire episode about this from the original series called Equal Fights that clearly the reboot never bothered to learn anything from. Man Up sucks more to me now than it did back then, but it's not quite in the absolute worst territory. Even still, I do not like this episode. Number 22. In the Garden of Good and Eddie. God, that title is a mouthful, and not in a good way. Hmm, let's see here. Eddie is an annoying character who's actually named Tabitha, but goes by Eddie because LOL so random XD. The girls get frustrated with the tomato worm for ruining their experience at the local farmer's market. Mojo shows up but is incompetent. At least some of the backgrounds look nice in certain shots, but otherwise this episode is completely forgettable. Next. Number 21. One of the most egregious ripoffs of the season, Secret Swapper of Doom is literally just lying around the house from start to finish, except it has a catchy song in the middle that still reminds me of Sound of Colors every time I think about it. The ending Stinger reveal, with it being him behind all this, never goes anywhere, and the professor deserved to be publicly humiliated considering how awful of a parent he was. I don't feel bad for him. Not. One. Bit. But yeah, just replace the secrets with lies and you've got lying around the house. There's no subtlety here. This is a direct copy-paste of an original series episode, and while I can't necessarily call it direct plagiarism, I can at least say at the bare minimum that it screams total laziness. I really don't see what there is to gain from this episode. Oh, wow, lying is bad. Haven't heard that one before. Please. Number 20. While the episode itself is mediocre for the most part, I will never forget how idiotic this show was for taking a creature that was explicitly, undeniably, irrefutably designed after a chicken and calling it a chinchillosaurus. A freaking three-year-old could look at this design and tell you it looks like a chicken. How does somebody get that wrong? Other than it being a four-legged creature, which is a trait shared by all sorts of living things, there is not a single aspect about this design that is related to a chinchilla in any sense of the word. So why was it called that? One of the greatest mysteries I'll never understand, and I know for a fact that this was the reboot being stupid, because there are other hybrid creatures that are mentioned at one scene in the episode where they do call them by the appropriate animal names. So again, how did it mess this up? 
The rest of Cheap Thrills is lackluster at best. I spent the entire time rewatching this just wishing Buttercup would shut up about her stupid frisbee and that Blossom would get off her phone for two seconds to actually do something about solving the problem. But these characters are literally boiled down to doing this exact one thing for the entire 11 minutes. There's no more depth to it than that, and their incompetence is frustrating. Hey, kid! You know I just bought that, right? And you still need to find my Zoomsby. The Zoomsby? Yes! <gasps> my Zoomsby! You know, if I lived with any other family in the world, this story would have ended with me getting my Zoomsby out of the bushes this morning. The only reason I'm ranking this episode a bit higher than the other previous few that I've talked about is for that crayon drawing sequence in the middle. That moment contained the only hint of creativity that was put into this entire episode, but it was pretty enjoyable and definitely held my attention for the minute-long run time that it maintains, so there's one positive thing I can say at least. Number 19. When it comes to forgettable episodes, dare I say Odd Bubbles Out might be one of the most unmemorable episodes of the entire series. Despite the fact that this is Donnie's second appearance in the show, I almost always forget that this episode is a thing because it's not terrible enough to be memorable. It's just mildly bad. What a pitiful attempt at drama this is. The whole episode is just Donnie replacing Bubbles with this new girl Chelsea who turns out to be a robot made by Mojo that he planned to use to replace Bubbles all along. Problems with the episode is that Donnie and Chelsea's entire relationship occurs off screen in between scenes so the audience never has any idea how they became friends or why Donnie is suddenly acting the way he is towards Bubbles. The reboot loved to try these attempts at like sitcom level drama with creating riffs in relationships but none of them ever really worked because the show doesn't know how to write characters well. The ending battle is also stupid because the Powerpuff Girls can get knocked down by glitter and also this whole spoon reflection thing is embarrassingly bad. I'm not laughing with the show, I'm laughing at the show for thinking this was an exciting finisher to the conflict. Donnie might be the least obnoxious in this episode out of any he's appeared in, but that isn't really a positive thing. Snooze fest. Number 18. This episode is fucking boring. Hope is a boring character. I feel nothing towards Blossom's plight in the episode, nor do I care about Buttercup and Bubbles watching Space Tow Truck, which the episode feels the need to cut back to every 30 seconds. The solution to the problem being this really terrible crowd chant is an uninspired resolution and is really just another excuse to make the girls look like music stars because the first season was obsessed with doing this for some reason. Seasons 2 and 3 really cut back on this idea, thankfully, but it just makes you wonder why this was even a thing to begin with. Anyways, yeah, Puffdora's box is boring and I hate the demeaning ending that talks down to its audience like we're idiots. Well kids, the lesson of this episode is, don't tell the viewer what they were supposed to get out of it, leave it to their own interpretation. This is Elementary Story Writing 101. Red car missing wheels on accident? Hmm. Red car missing wheels on purpose? Hmm. Hmm. Number 17. I really don't care for this episode at all in the slightest. Poor Bucks seemed to be a fan favorite of season 1 back when I was reviewing it in the early days, but I really don't understand why. I remember viewers left and right commenting on how they couldn't wait for me to see Poor Bucks and it was the best episode of the show and yada yada yada. I'm sorry guys, I just don't see it. And I didn't even go in with high expectations. Poor Bucks is set up with the premise of Princess's father going bankrupt and so she gets kicked out of the house and stays with the Powerpuff Girls for a while, which is totally laughable. Like, what, am I supposed to feel bad for this asshole in this scene? Please. Eventually, Blossom convinces Princess to be nice and they become best friends, but then Princess betrays her because she was evil all along, but maybe she still respects Blossom as a friend based on the ending, but oh wait, this never gets visited again because in season 2 she just goes back to being the same stuck-up snob that she is in season 1, so it was completely pointless, just like all Princess episodes. The song is bland, the art style is different for that sequence but not necessarily amazing or bold, Princess completely murders a family of four without any acknowledgement, Benny Benjamins is a stupid character character, the dialogue of Princess's former posse is a total cringe fest, and the ending is a completely meaningless waste of time because like I said it never comes back otherwise the status quo would change. I just don't see anything of value here, and I get no emotional response for Princess in this scene because she's a shit character. Am I supposed to feel bad for Blossom because she was betrayed by a character with an evil background? She would have known better that this would happen. Honestly, she's the smart one. It'd make more sense for Bubbles to fall for this being the gullible one, but hey, this show never understood its characters to begin with. 
with. Poor Bucks got more praise than it deserved. I'm sorry, but it's not special, at least in my eyes. It's generic and uninspired, which I guess made it seem like it was great when compared next to the usual garbage the reboot was putting out at the time. Number 16. Coming up next is The Secret Life of Blossom, and no, I refuse to say the last word of that episode title because it's stupid, and it was also retconned in season 2 anyways as one of the few issues that the show actually bothered to correct in later seasons. I don't know why the show thought Powerpuff was a suitable last name for them in the first place, but hey, here we are. Anyways, this episode is just one of those three mini-stories in one, with Blossom imagining herself as a painter in the Renaissance, a space explorer, and a dance enthusiast who needs to save the rec center, yay! Honestly, what I remember about this episode was just that I was really on fire with the gags in this review, between Bill Nye's swearing and the R2-B2 response. That just makes no fucking sense. I mean, it's just bullshit. Fuck. How's that for a callback? Anyways, yeah, the episode's fine. I don't hate it. The first two fantasies aren't very exciting, but I kinda like the third segment a little bit. The giant robot gag is tedious and unnecessary though, and I couldn't care less about the ending. If there was more superheroing going on in this episode, it could've actually been closer to the top if I'm being honest, but alas, that is not the case, so it is where it is in this comfortable number 16 spot. Number 15. Next up, we have Princess Buttercup, and honestly, as far as this episode goes, I'm really indifferent on it. This is the introductory episode to the poorly written reboot version of Princess Morbucks, who isn't voiced by Jennifer Hale despite the fact that she is still a part of the voice cast as Miss Keen because I guess the show thought somebody else was a better voice actor for the character than Jennifer freaking Hale. Don't really see how that's possible because the reboot voice of Princess doesn't even compare to the original, but hey. I'll never let go of the fact that this show, claiming to be feminist, chose to explicitly rehire all of the original male voice actors but replaced every single female on the cast except for Jennifer Hale as Miss Keen only. The hypocrisy of this decision absolutely floors me. How did Cartoon Network have the gall to claim they were trying to empower women when the main females of the original show weren't even told that they weren't coming back, but the males got to return to their jobs and get paid for it? Equal treatment in the workplace? What a joke. They found out about the new voices at the same time as everybody else, and that's absolutely infuriating. If Cartoon Network wanted to replace the main cast, they should have done it to everybody, not just the females. Ugh, nothing frustrates me more than somebody or something doing the opposite of what they claim to be. Anyways, Princess Buttercup is also the introduction to the Derby Taunts and their least terrible appearance because Maylin got worse and worse with each episode she returned for. The Derby Taunts are paid by Princess to be Buttercup's friends, but then they actually become Buttercup's friends, and then there's a pitiful attempt at a monster battle with the only satisfying moment being this punch. After all, I'm pretty much the most beautiful, most talented, most powerful, most... <laughs> Most annoying. This show desperately needed 1000% more of the moments like that. I'm glad they at least don't paint Buttercup in a bad light for spending time with her new friends because shockingly she doesn't do anything wrong here. It's got a giant monster and a mech robot battle which like I said sounds cooler than it is. At least some elements of a superhero show are present here in this episode specifically but it doesn't really impress in any one way. Not in the worst tier of reboot episodes, but not good either. Number 14. You know, when it comes to the episode Electric Buttercup, I actually remember my review better than the actual episode because I was having such a blast editing it together. Yeah, back when I thought a 22 minute video was a challenge. Anyways, witnessing this episode again, it is one of the better episodes of the series just by simple comparison because the only major flaws I have to share my grievances for are him's feeble method of putting his plan into action and the entire Thrash character. Getting the latter out of the way first, the fact that her only justification for being an amazing rock star is that she smashes guitars proves absolutely nothing about her talent and makes Buttercup look like an idiot, which she is. Secondly, her appearance at the very end of the episode where she descends from the heavens absolutely makes zero fucking sense because it comes out of nowhere and Thrash just knows who Buttercup is because Valhalla, yes yeah, she can. Can we band battle now? Guys, I smashed my guitar. Again! Now we can't play at all! Ugh! Valhalla, yeah you can! Uh... What? The way the episode presents him in disguise as Steve makes little sense because when Buttercup arrives to the shop, he refuses to give her the guitar and then just does a complete 180 for zero reason and gives her the guitar. Like, why reject giving her one in the first place? If this is part of your plan, why do you deny it? Sorry kid, no dice. What? Don't you want to give her the guitar? 
Ah! The episode also implies Buttercup's known Steve for a while, but that means him would have had to put a ton of effort into doing this when he could have easily done something else like sell Blossom's soul for a dollar the way he did in season 3. And besides, wasn't he busy spending 10 years on an island with Bliss anyways? Again, compared to most of the other episodes I've already discussed though, these problems aren't anywhere near as bad. I actually enjoy the rock off sequence between him and Buttercup aside from the whole fingers bit. The colors are psychedelic and the action is some of the more intense kind we barely get in the show as it is. I also dig the voice modification and designs for Blossom and Bubbles, although I wish this wasn't another Buttercup Savior episode because yes, I'm coining that term as its own genre now. It's certainly got a more interesting premise than a lot of the other episodes and there aren't too many bullshit morals or forced relationships, so it's got that going for it, but... Even though I have more negative things to say about it, I don't really dislike it all that much, although again that might just be the fond memories I have of reviewing it that are influencing that. Number 13. Okay, so I don't hate Tiara Trouble, but I'll be damned if it isn't one of the biggest throwaways of an episode we've seen in the entire series. Having a ton of the PPG villains get together in one giant competition? That sounds great, until you realize it's for a stupid beauty pageant that completely demeans the villains as characters. I mean, what the heck are the Gang Green Gang, Mojo, and Fuzzy even doing here? Need I remind you that this is basically the only major role, if you can even call it that, that Fuzzy ever gets in the entire series, and the Gang Green Gang only get one other episode after this one. It's just a montage, because the show sure loves to overuse that method of plot progression to literal death. In fact, I bet you more than half of the episodes in this series contain a moment where I had to say, next we get a montage, because the writing was so lazily plotted out and needed a quick way to get from A to B and a montage seemed to always be the answer. It is obnoxious how much this show relied on the use of montage as a crutch because it couldn't tell a compelling story naturally and always felt the need to fast forward through things just to get to the next section. Gotta get from point A to point B, we only got 11 minutes, go go go! And then it continues to go on and waste more of our time with sheer nonsense anyways. At least Tiara Trouble has him doing something evil I guess and Demonic Princess is kinda cool. I like the green fire aesthetic and how the lighting of the entire room changes when this transformation takes place, but the fight between her the girls could have been better because it's just resolved with singing rather than actual combat. Also, I'm not really fond of beauty pageants in general because they serve as nothing more than vessels for parents to get away with abusing their children, but nobody's ever going to do anything about that. But hey, that's all I'm going to say on the matter, so yeah. At least Bubbles does some cute things like lift the building, so it has its moments. I've seen things ain't no man should have never seen. Number 12. This episode is fine. It's not great, it's just fine. The girls stay up late playing a video game and then the fashionistas capture them and the mayor saves the day. There are references to Donkey Kong and Scorpion because, oh look, we can reference retro video games, herp a derp a derp. Even though most of the kids watching this show wouldn't know who Scorpion is, but hey, you know, it's only made for kids and not adults. The episode itself is just fine and that's why I've ranked it where I have. The most heinous characteristic that everyone remembers this episode for is the removal of Miss Bellum's character from the show. Ignorance. Utter ignorance. Yet another example of the misinterpretation that dearly cost the show one of its most powerful characters in the whole series. On one hand, I'm very grateful that her character was saved from being completely ruined the way characters like the Professor and Mojo were. On the other hand, it's a case of Cartoon Network doing the exact opposite thing that they were claiming to be doing. Ignorance, incompetence, and inconsistency. Nothing can describe this show better than this triple I trifecta right here. Bye Bye Bellum by itself, once again, is fine and I won't let the issues that took place outside of it affect my ranking of the episode as it exists by itself. I just felt like this was the best time to bring up those other points, and I really don't have anything else to say about the episode. I'm at least trying to be fair in that aspect here. Number 11. Perhaps I was a bit too nice on this episode the first go around. See, I still think People Pleaser is a good episode in the sense that it makes sense for Blossom to be this hero that wants to help everyone to where she feels so overworked and overwhelmed because she's constantly fitting more and more people into her schedule to the point that they're just taking advantage of her, unintentionally. But the episode's just so boring. It's boring to watch, there's hardly any excitement, the B-plot with Buttercup and Bubbles is tolerable, and the giant monster that they fight isn't really that exciting and kind of a mess of a design if I'm being honest. It's justified in the episode by the fact that it's supposed to be a mess of a science project, but the actual battle isn't exciting to watch. Still, it's not as bad as most of the episodes in the season, so I rank it considerably higher than those, but I have to drop it out of the top 5 and down uh, several spots because I really did give it too much credit at that time. After dealing with a constant run of bad episodes in the second half of season 1, this one felt like a breath of fresh air. Really, it's just dull. 
Number 10. Blue Ribbon Blues is fine for the most part. I don't mind the idea of Blossom idolizing some famous scientist and leaping at the opportunity to work with him on a project. The problem is that I find it impossible to believe that she wouldn't know what the dude looks like when she knows so much about him. She has a cell phone with internet access at her fingertips. She can literally look up a picture of the guy, but instead she falls for the school janitor pretending to be him because that's what the story needed. No thought was put into it beyond that, and it shows. Other than that glaring flaw, I don't mind it. It makes sense for the character to want to participate in a science fair by creating this device, and the villain is played as a lame joke in the end, which works decently well. Yeah, honestly, this episode only ranks as high as it does because the ranking is skewed by so many worse episodes. In a regular show of a decent quality, this would be towards the bottom without a doubt. Number 9. And here we have The Squashening, the other three mini-story episode of Season 1. Well. I like the third segment. It had some cool backgrounds and it felt very much like a bubble story, so props to that. Blossom's Frankenstein parody was boring and uninspired as heck, and Buttercup's zombie apocalypse was the most generic nonsense I've ever seen, with its whole gimmick being that the characters become bred zombies instead of regular zombies. I happen to know a thing or two about scary. <laughs> you, the girl dressed like a peacock lady. <laughs> Whatever. It's not the worst thing ever as far as Halloween specials go, but it leaves a lot to be desired and sadly, none of the Halloween specials that the reboot had put out were ever able to fully satisfy. Number 8. As the first episode of the series, not created, but to premiere, Escape from Monster Island originally made the reboot look kind of promising. I mean, sure, there's the girls obsessing over a boy band, the jinx moment, and the unapologetically terrible rap battle. But aside from this, the episode is far from the worst of the show. The girls go to Monster Island, a location from the classic series where they have to rescue the mayor from certain doom. Some of the monster designs are pretty cool, especially the flame monster and pterodactyl creature. The joke where it just blows up in the sky for no reason is still my favorite joke from the episode to boot. It's an interesting way to kind of show how the conflict between Blossom and Buttercup progresses, and if it weren't for the fact that every single episode in the reboot practically has to have the two of them argue at some point within it, this would probably be more significant. I like the episode more than most, and I think it's serviceable. Again, it's not great and it has its problems, but at least the plot and characters are well written enough to where there aren't a lot of gaping plot holes. Number 7. I like this episode more now than I did back when I reviewed it, actually. The professor, while kinda still being forcefully oblivious in certain situations where he ignores bubbles that I don't really buy, he is mostly a good dad in this one, and for that I'm very grateful. The biggest flaw with the episode is that once again this is a Bubbles episode where the plot doesn't make sense for the character because in what world was Bubbles ever neglected by her father in favor of Buttercup or Blossom when episodes like Strong Armed and Bubbles of the Opera exist in the same season where the two of them are fully connecting with each other one-on-one? -on -one? It doesn't make sense within the continuity of the show, but by itself it, it works, and with that one major gripe aside, I do at least appreciate that we get to see some proper parenting from the professor at the end. Plus, Blossom and Buttercup murder Schedulebot, which was deserved. I just wish he never came back in season 2. Number 6. This episode has no reason being in a show made for kids if that was the intended audience, but if the reboot chooses to go the route of it being a general family show that has references to things that adults would understand, like The Stayover being a total parody of the movie The Hangover and The Candy being an allegory for drugs and alcohol, then I guess my criticisms are valid after all. Anyways, this episode, it's good enough. It's really not that fun and I didn't get it the first go around because I hadn't seen The Hangover at that point, so honestly I'm still ranking it lower than I think it could be because it does a poor job of standing on its own. There's no explanation for why there's a, just a bull in the girl's kitchen or why Mojo is there in makeup to somebody who hasn't seen the original film to figure out what those are references to. It's just a bunch of non sequiturs jumbled together, if you don't have that perspective. For instance, I thought it was stupid that Bubbles was there on the couch the whole time, but then I learned of how that ties into the movie and what it was going for, so it makes more sense. Having seen the film, I appreciate this episode a ton more. I truly think it is a decent parody now that I know more than I did back then when I first reviewed it, but it still feels like it doesn't belong in the Powerpuff Girls, you know? Hey, I'll still take it. Number 5. A much needed improvement from the first Man Up episode, Man Up 2 is a little more exciting seeing as it does away with the stupid zen nonsense that never amounted to anything and instead has Man Boy steal the local park's water for his lawn. Thus, it's up to the girls to stop him. Of course, in typical reboot fashion, Blossom and Bubbles get captured, so it's up to Buttercup to save the day, and while yes, I am absolutely sick of seeing the green one save the other two all the time, that truly didn't become a serious problem until Season 2 came along. Season 1 is guilty of it, sure, but not to the same volume. 
I think it's fine. There are a few jokes in there that I liked, such as the wealthy individuals who are powerful in the sense of their economic status rather than brute strength, and the lawnmower thing is a little over the top that I couldn't help but crack a smile. Yeah, it's okay. Not super great, but okay. Number 4. Yeah, Fashion Forward is still near the top. Could use a bit more action and the fashionistas could be written less like products of their time with the out of touch lingo, but I dig the 1984 references and the professor is an almost responsible adult in this one. What a rarity. Oh man, you gotta check out this fanfic I wrote about that. Don't have anything new to say on this one though, my opinion of it hasn't changed at all, so just see what I said in the top 5 video or my original review and you'll get the idea. It's good. Number 3. Yeah, Viral Spiral is still towards the top of my list because it ultimately is a lot of fun. Buttercup and Blossom go inside the internet to stop the Amoeba Boys who are acting as a virus infecting everything, which on one hand that's not really accurate because Amoebas are actually considered a living thing whereas viruses aren't, but hey I'll take what I can get because Chuck McCann, rest his soul, did a great job voicing the trio one last time here in this episode. There's a somewhat action-y chase sequence at the end as the girls defeat the Amoeba Boys and put a stop to Silico's plan, which, oh right, this is Silico's first appearance. Too bad we never learned anything more about him aside from his backstory, which was a total mess of a continuity error as I already explained. At least in this episode he had seemed interesting and had some promise. The Facebook and rap sequence was needlessly unnecessary and it's guilty of the same hey look at this meme humor that other episodes had, so it's nowhere near perfect, but it's good. Come on, Bubbles! I would still argue that Blossom would have been the better character choice as the computer programmer. I don't know how many times I have to say it, but nobody has ever given me a compelling argument for why Bubbles is the best choice, aside from the fact that she can speak multiple languages, but I would just simply counter that by saying you need a completely separate knowledge base for how to understand a programming language compared to one who understands the English language. I've watched every episode of this series, so I know these characters pretty well like the back of my hand, and I can say with certainty that it makes no sense for her character, and I will die on this hill. It was done for publicity. That is it. Number two. Now personally, while I may have bumped this down from the number one spot, I still find The Big Sleep to be a great episode because aside from the stupid random expressions and just a few seconds of screen time and the whole spoiler Cheryl thing, I find the majority of The Big Sleep to be a fun family bonding experience. I like that the professor spends time with the girls fighting a supernatural pillow that's haunting their house. That feels like a very fatherly thing that he would do with his daughters. I like that this episode is full of references to former horror properties that aren't directly in your face and don't take away from what's going on within the story itself. They are lines that apply to the given situation while also calling out to other media at the same time. That is how you do it. I like watching the girls each get picked off by the pillow one by one in a very horror movie-esque fashion, and the final reveal at the end with the professor is oh so satisfying because it actually makes sense. The only reason it's moved down in my ranking is because this is an episode that I could see being in other shows that aren't the Powerpuff Girls. It isn't specific enough to a superhero show for me to consider this the best episode of the season. And number one. You know what's sad? When the best episode of the entire first season is completely unintentional because the entire reason it was made in the first place was to unironically advertise the new toy line that was released alongside the show. No joke. Upon further reflection, I consider Power Up Puff to be the best episode of season one for one reason above all else. Actually feels like an episode of a show based around superheroes, and I can't say that for any of the other 38 I just talked about. Notice how every single other episode on this list features a a pretty generic, non-specific plot about the characters doing something that could occur in any old fictional fantasy show. But Power Up Puff, being based around a superhero who struggles with the fact that they haven't developed the same cool superpower that their siblings did? That's more specific. That's more like it. I understand some people can't look past the toy advertisements plastered all over the place, and that's fine. That's on them. The episode has action against multiple different monsters, and sure the scenes have the same typical problems that most of the other episodes do, but at least it tries a tiny bit harder than the rest. Yes, it's not without its flaws. The thunderstorm scene where Blossom just floats down the alley is absurdly overdramatic for the kind of story that this is, and the food scientist that creates these monsters is just allowed to do this with no repercussions or anything to where it just feels forced the second time, but like, why was he invited back? But ultimately, I genuinely think that this was an episode that belongs in a Powerpuff reboot. Sure, probably as like an average episode, because let's be honest, this one isn't super memorable and hardly anyone remembers it. But as far as reboot standards go, this one is the best bar none, and I've really come around to it since my initial review on it.
And there you have it, my final true ranking of the first season of Powerpuff Girls 2016. Like I said, a lot has changed since those initial reviews I made several years ago at this point, so let this stand as a more definitive summary of how I feel on each of them. I was still learning a lot as a reviewer back then, and it definitely shows with the quality of those videos. I mean, they've aged like sour milk, let's be real. I most likely won't be doing this for seasons 2 and 3 since my stance on those episodes has largely remained the same, so don't expect anything for those seasons because I really don't have anything new to say. This was a nice, one-time thing that I'm glad I got to do again, but now that my thoughts are out there, I think all is said and done. I hope you all enjoyed this little revisit to the past as much as I did, but now it's time to look forward to the future. Until next time. Shadow Streak, signing off.